This is what a disease-free future looks like. Many people live in bio-alive habitats built from fungus and bacteria. This constant exposure to nature boosts the immune system. From birth, people use high-tech home scanners to analyze the DNA of microbes living in their guts. Armed with this data, doctors intentionally infect patients with combinations of good bacteria to keep the bad ones in check, preventing disease before it starts. By using advanced technology to adjust the microbes in everyone's body, modern diseases are mostly a thing of the past. It all of a sudden hits you like that inside yeah. you right now. Today, scientists are blazing a trail to this very future. You're actually more microbe than you're human. I want to know what breakthroughs are being made. Bio-augmenting our bodies will have a fundamental impact on modern-day plagues. That will forge the future, too. To me, that was like, whoa. A disease-free world. My name is Julia Ravy. I decided to become a neuroscientist because my nan and several great aunts developed Alzheimer's disease. This loss has made me determined to find a cure by any means. I'm fascinated by recent research that links diseases of the brain to microbes in our bodies. And I think this is an avenue that is just coming into its own in terms of research. Microbes are tiny living things, smaller than the eye can see. Inside the body, microbes like bacteria, parasites and viruses can cause any number of infectious diseases. So what would happen if we just eradicated all of the body's nasty microorganisms? What would the health of society look like? To answer that, I want to understand how microorganisms cause disease in the first place. So I've come to Perth, Australia to meet Dr. Barry Marshall. Barry's groundbreaking research turned the world's understanding of stomach cancer on its head and won him the Nobel Prize in medicine. Barry is a complete science legend. Today, Barry is hunting a nasty microbe called Helicobacter. This bacteria infects the guts of animals and makes them sick. There are about 30 different kinds of Helicobacter. So one of the things I'm planning to do today is um, go around, get some uh, animal scat. So most of it's kangaroo. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing the whole process. I've never seen a kangaroo, I don't think. Barry is trying to figure out where Helicobacter came from by searching for it in a wide range of animals. You see those big grassy areas over there? That's where the kangaroos might be hanging out. So now you've seen one. Seen one. Well, I think I can see one. Oh, there, yeah. there. It looks like it's good enough. By analysing kangaroo faeces, Barry can get a snapshot of the microorganisms living inside these kangaroos' guts. You get all the different kinds of bacteria. We'll extract the DNA and just put all the DNA through the computer. It was the hunt for Helicobacter that led Barry and his colleague Robin Warren to overturn what they thought might be a myth. Namely, the widely held belief in the medical community that stomach ulcers were caused by stress. I did have patients who had ulcers and it annoyed me that they seemed to be normal people, but when you couldn't find the cause of their ulcer, you'd always, the medical books would blame it on stress. And I'd say, well, these people just seem to be normal. When they looked at patients' stomach ulcers under the microscope, what they found was astonishing. And these bacteria were unusual. They're curved bacteria. The infectious agent at work was Helicobacter pylori. H. pylori, for short, is a variation of Helicobacter that infects humans. The presence of this microbe in the human stomach upended decades of medical understanding. All of the textbooks said that 
nothing can grow in our stomachs, you know? It's a sterile environment for these types of bacteria. Mm. But your findings proved otherwise. So that became our research project. How could bacteria live in the stomach when there's so much acid? We knew these bacteria were really only human bacteria. So we had to find a human volunteer who could take the bacteria and maybe get an ulcer. He had to prove that these bacteria could infect a healthy stomach at all costs. So eventually I did a self-experiment. We decided that I was going to drink the bacteria, which I did. So we grew the bacteria up in uh, meat broth, like beef soup, if you like, and uh, I drank it down. And then I was having an endoscopy to see if they had colonised my stomach. And after 10 days, uh, the bacteria were there, the infection was taking hold, and they were damaging the lining of the stomach. Barry was probably the first person to be happy with this diagnosis. I didn't have any evidence until I did that self-experiment. Barry's experiment was a success. But how can H. pylori thrive in the stomach's extreme conditions? We found out that Helicobacter are unique. They make ammonia and they neutralise the hydrochloric acid. So they can survive, nothing else can. Once established in the stomach, these invasive bacteria lead to ulcers. And if allowed to fester, they can cause cancer. The question became, how could these killer microbes be stopped? So I was excited about the fact that potentially you could cure something if it's caused by bacteria. It turned out that antibiotics can kill H. pylori and cure the ulcers in a matter of weeks. Long before the discovery of microbes, scientists had no idea of the role microscopic germs played in human health. But in the 19th century, French scientist Louis Pasteur developed germ theory, which postulated that microorganisms cause infectious disease. And British surgeon Joseph Lister found a way to prevent germs from infecting his patients by using antiseptics to sterilise his surgical equipment and clean wounds. But the big breakthrough happened in 1928 when Scottish physician Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillin. Penicillin was an immediate cure-all for scarlet fever, meningitis and even pneumonia. This medication launched the modern era of antibiotics. I thought it was a great kindness to be able to tell people, no, it's not stress. Take some antibiotics and you'll be cured. Today, ulcers are no longer a chronic illness for many. And in the US, cases of stomach cancer have decreased almost every year. Like most people, I like to prove other people are wrong. I didn't realise it was going to take 23 years before people really believed it and accepted it. By eradicating the microbes that cause stomach ulcers and cancer, Barry's research is forging a disease-free future before infections even start. In the future, the exterior doors of most homes have microbial scanners that detect foreign agents. When people enter the home, the scanner sweeps the entire body for harmful microbes. If detected, a home health robot immediately dispenses the appropriate medication. Most people no longer suffer from infectious disease, and doctor's visits are mostly a thing of the past. A disease-free future like this sounds very appealing. So what would happen if we just eradicated all microbes? To find out, I first want to know exactly what functions they serve. So I've come to Amsterdam to speak with biologist and head of the Microbia Museum, Jasper Bex. He has some sobering information about the microbes' role in the human body. There's about 10 times more microbes in and on your body than you have body cells. So you're actually more microbe than you're human. That is quite a scary thought. So I'm basically just a carrier for the microbe. Microbia developed a technology to help visualise this unseen universe. This is where you can visit your own microbes. This is you. Hey. You're being scanned. We're going to see who has the most microbes. Uh, so every dot that you see here is a, is a microbe, a total of 100,000 billion of them. 99% of all those trillions of microbes live in your intestines. These are all digital dots, of course, but yeah. we also have them alive. 
The staggering number of microbes on display makes my skin crawl. But there's an odd sense of beauty to behold. When you see these under the microscope moving, it all of a sudden hits you like they're inside you right now. It's, that is crazy. The first person to accidentally see these tiny organisms was Anthony van Leeuwenhoek in the 17th century. He was a draper. In order to test the quality of the, of the cotton and of the threads, he decided to build his own magnifying lenses. And this is what he made. And he was able to reach a magnification of 250 times. By looking at everything from water to the plaque on his teeth, he found the world teeming with all kinds of strange microscopic creatures. That made him the first scientist, so to speak, to discover the invisible world of microbes. But in fact, these creatures have been with us all along. Single-cell bacteria evolved three and a half billion years ago. They are the oldest life forms on Earth. En masse, these microbes exhaled oxygen, which eventually formed our modern-day atmosphere and created an ecosystem that changed the face of the entire planet. Scientists believe our oxygenated ecosystem led to the evolution of multicellular life forms at least 600 million years ago. And this, in turn, led to the evolution of even more complex creatures, including us humans. In this light, microbes are the most fundamental part of being human. They digest your food, they produce all kinds of different vitamins and hormones. So microbes are essential to our way of life. Scientists call this vast collection of microbes living in us and on us the human microbiome. In essence, you're, you're a walking ecosystem. That's honestly mind-blowing. Each body is a unique walking ecosystem. But how exactly do these trillions of microbes contribute to a person's well-being? And how do we get our individual microbiome in the first place? To find out, I've come to Rutgers University to meet biologist Dr. Maria Gloria Dominguez-Bello. She's researching each person's dynamic relationship with their own individual microbiome. Microbes are part of us. If we didn't have them, we wouldn't be healthy. We are now understanding that we didn't evolve alone. Every animal and plant on Earth evolved with bacteria in particular. Like a coral reef or a rainforest, the microbiome is an ecosystem unto itself. When you have an ecosystem that is perturbed, the first question an ecologist asks is, can you restore the ecosystem? Gloria's understanding of the microbiome started in, of all places, the Amazon jungle, where she saw firsthand how human microbial ecosystems can quickly change. I've been working in the Amazon for the last 30 years, since I was uh, a student. Amerindians have been living there pretty isolated for the last 20,000 years. And I was very interested in understanding the microbiome of traditional peoples. Through skin, mouth, and fecal samples, she measured the impact that external environments in which people lived had on their internal ecosystems. Gloria found that those living in the Amazonian jungle have a significantly higher diversity in their microbes as city dwellers living in industrialized countries. But when an individual from the remote Amazon moved to the city, they quickly lost their microbial diversity. This leads to a startling conclusion. So that work has shown us that urbanization depletes and destroys the diversity of the microbiome. And in the gut, diversity is good. We know that because diseases decrease diversity, and when you decrease diversity, you cause disease. There is a strong association between high diversity in the gut microbiome and health. Knowing how vital microbiome diversity is in fighting disease, Gloria is investigating how humans acquire microbes in the first place. Here we go. Um. And how do babies originally acquire their microbes? Inside the uterus, the baby is not being exposed to microbes, but once mom breaks water, the baby comes in contact with the birth canal, which is loaded with massive amount of bacteria. It turns out the acquisition of microbes starts when a child is born. 
By the time the baby's out, the baby's heavily colonized. So it's a microbial baptism. Then there's a skin-to-skin -skin contact. That's the secondary exposure. Then the mouth of the mother kissing is a, another exposure. The environment of that baby is heavily maternal, and mom is a main source of bacteria. That first set of bacteria start the process of immune education. The immune system will recognize the good bacteria, don't attack. But modern medicine is changing the immunity education that comes from this microbial baptism. The rate of cesarean births is increasing. Since 1990, C-sections have more than tripled, going from around 6% to 21% of all births globally. C-sections successfully take the baby out, but without passing through the birth canal. This means that C-section babies are born from a sterile uterus into the air of an operating room. And Gloria has discovered that this may increase the risk of many diseases. C-section has been associated in humans with increased risk of the modern diseases. For example, an increased risk of asthma, type 1 diabetes, allergies, and obesity. Starting at birth, the first three years of life are critical in establishing a healthy diversity of microbes. I think it's just fascinating that many new parents are probably quite unaware that the first few years of life are so important for the baby's development of their microbiome. Not only that, Gloria's research is revealing that the overuse of antibiotics to eradicate harmful microbes early in life is leading to a bigger problem than we ever realised. We have impacted every step of development. The average baby receives 2.7 doses of antibiotics in the first year of life. We have been so successful controlling infectious diseases, but what we didn't know was the collateral damage that was caused to our microbiome. We have increased the risk of our kids to live lives with chronic diseases. We evolved with this biology. We cannot ignore it because if we do, we are screwing the health of our future generations. While helpful in many ways, sterilization of modern day practices like C-sections and antibiotics could actually be harming our microbiomes, making us more susceptible to disease. But we can't just get rid of modern medicine altogether. Antibiotics and C-sections still save millions of lives. So what's the right approach? Gloria has invited me to her home to meet her husband, Dr. Martin Blazer. Hey, how are you? Hi, Julia. Lovely to meet you. Martin is a microbiologist who also researches the microbiome. When it comes to using antibiotics, both Gloria and Martin believe we need a better balance. By and large, we have overestimated the value of antibiotics. We're giving antibiotics like water. The big dogma is it might not help you, but it won't hurt. But what if it does hurt? There's more and more evidence, we're losing microbial diversity. It, it's just going down. Martin and Gloria want to prevent the further loss of diversity in our microbiomes. We've overdone it. Now we have to find a more moderate approach. And, and ultimately, if we find a more modern approach, then maybe we can stop the decline in diversity. But how do we get it back? That's going to require restoration. One intriguing candidate for microbial restoration is the H. pylori bacteria, the same one that Barry Marshall infected himself with. Most doctors in the world are trying to get rid of Helicobacter on the idea that it's a bad guy. And it is, but since then, we've been finding all kinds of good things that the bacteria does. It turns out that some microbes are double agents and can be both bad and good for the body. What are the good things you found out about H. pylori? Well, we found that people who don't have Helicobacter uh, have more disease of their esophagus. And we also found that children who don't have Helicobacter have more asthma. And that's really big, because asthma is going up, Helicobacter is going down. We think that they're linked. Though it's been with humanity for millennia, today only 5% of children in the US have the H. pylori bacteria. So if H. pylori can cause stomach cancer, but eliminating it increases rates of asthma, what should we choose? It turns out we may not have to. 
I predict that we'll be giving Helicobacter pylori back to children so that uh, we can protect them against things like asthma. But we might want to eradicate it when they're 40 years old so that they won't get stomach cancer. We have to treat these bugs differently in childhood and once you're an adult. This revelation shows how we could begin to get the balance right by treating the microbiome differently at different stages in a person's life, Gloria and Martin's dynamic approach could be the key to eliminating modern diseases. In the future, nearly every baby is born naturally at home. When C-sections are needed, babies are bathed and infected with microbes taken from the mother's birth canal. From childhood, everyone receives personalized doses of healthy microbes as regularly as vaccines. Only prescribed in severe cases, the overuse of antibiotics has plummeted. If the key to a disease-free future lies in managing the balance of good and bad microbes, then what we put into our bodies will have a huge impact on the microbiome. To better understand how the body's microbes work as a whole, I've come to San Diego to meet Dr. Rob Knight. He's looking for ways to create a better balance in individuals' microbiomes by sequencing their DNA. Based on numbers alone, this is a very daunting task. You have about 20,000 or so unique genes in your human genome, but you have millions of genes in your microbiome. And all of those microbial genes, we're just finding out about how they make us who we are. That is incredible that we call ourselves human, but maybe we're not so human after all. <laughs> Rob's quest is an ambitious undertaking. Through the American Gut Project he co-founded, he's crowdsourcing and analyzing stool samples from across the planet. And because it's an open source project, he'll ultimately share the conclusions of this big data with everyone. For now, by sequencing microbial DNA from a wide array of people, Rob's pioneering work is diving deeper into the human microbiome than ever before, especially in how our microbes respond to food. In tandem with this, Rob's team is also sequencing the DNA of the microbes that colonize the foods we eat to analyze and compare its impact on microbes in the human body. So what did you collect from the garden today? So we got another set of fruit and vegetable samples. Uh -huh. So rosemary, tomato, eggplant we got today. Uh -huh. Great. By understanding the microbial big picture, Rob has discovered something surprising. One of the most fascinating and most unexpected things was the particular ways that diet impacts the microbiome. Categories that people think are going to make a huge difference, like are you an omnivore, are you a vegan, are you on the paleo diet, that kind of thing. It has almost no bearing on your microbiome results. This research is contradicting prevailing wisdom. It turns out, what does affect the health of our gut microbiome is much more basic and even achievable for most of us. The things that do matter turn out to be things like how many different species of plants you ate in the last couple of weeks, uh, things like do you eat a lot of salty snacks or sugary snacks. Wow, that is really interesting work. Rob's research is showing that eating at least 30 different types of plants per week leads to a more diverse gut microbiome. And this matters, because this helps create a better balance of both the beneficial and harmful microbes that are in everyone. This microbial diversity dramatically increases the body's well-being. So, eat your veggies. But everyone's microbiome is not alike. Like a fingerprint, your gut microbiome is unique and responds differently than others. It even plays a role in how individuals respond to prescription drugs. One of the major things that we and others are trying to find out at the moment is how do you know what medications are going to work? It turns out that the microbiome explains a lot of that individual variability. That's because gut microbes play a role in how medications are metabolized in the body. An individual's microbiome can impact the effectiveness of drugs for Parkinson's, high cholesterol, and many other conditions. A better understanding of this complex relationship could lead to major breakthroughs in healthcare. This is already being exploited right now for cancer drugs, and so that's a very exciting frontier. I want to see if there are measures I can take to achieve a better microbial balance today. So I'm conducting a little experiment of my own with a sample kit from the American Gut Project. 
which contains tubes and swabs and some gloves. So I think we can all imagine exactly what this is for taking samples of. I'm eating junk food for three days and then a wide range of vegetables for three days. And I'll be taking two samples after the healthy food and after the unhealthy food and seeing if my microbiome has been altered. Oh, I'm gonna be sick, that is horrible. I'm bringing these samples to Dr. Jack Gilbert, the other co-founder of the American Gut Project. His team is using this research to tease out the body's specific relationship between our microbiome and the development of disease. What have you brought us? Well, this is a little bit mortifying. Um, I brought <laughs> you some samples from a small experiment that I decided to conduct okay. on myself. Yeah. I want to see if the health of my microbiome improves in the short term. Do you think that change could be seen in three days? It's a little short. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> limitation yeah, exactly. of time. Precisely. Short. Yeah. But it's enough to see some changes starting to occur. While the samples are processed, Jack walks me through the complex relationship between our microbes, food and disease. What yeah. we found was if you had a stable microbiome that was, say, promoting obesity, i.e. a microbiome that made you fat by producing chemicals which changed your relationship to food, it would take almost a year on a new diet to eradicate those microbes yeah. and change it to one that doesn't promote uh, weight gain. That's the problem with diets. <laughs> Nobody stays on them for an entire year. Also contributing to the chronic disease of obesity, a modern-day diet of highly processed foods can cause the microbiome to become imbalanced. Too much sugar, too much saturated fat is changing the types of bacteria which live inside us. To test the relationship between the microbiome and weight, researchers took faecal samples from obese mice and transferred these samples into the guts of lean, germ-free mice. Incredibly, this transfer changed the microbiome of the lean mice. After the microbial transplant, the lean mice gained weight and became obese. It turns out that gut bacteria play a big role in regulating the body's overall metabolism. Jack believes microbiomes adjusted for poor diets have a similar negative effect on humans, leading to any number of debilitating diseases. And we think that is having an impact upon things like diabetes and obesity, maybe even depression and anxiety. Similar microbiome transplant studies with mice suggest there is also a connection between the microbes in our guts and Alzheimer's. I am really interested in the link between the gut microbiome and Alzheimer's disease. You have a family history of Alzheimer's? I do, yes. That's my motivation for doing a PhD in the first place. So I have the genetic precursors as well. It's yes. one of the wonderful <laughs> gifts my mother gave me. Yes, uh, probably mine too. <laughs> exactly. There's a number of different ways the microbes in your gut can affect what goes on in your brain. One pathway is the vagus nerve. This long nerve connects the intestines with the brain, creating a two-way channel of communication. Research suggests that stress signals from the brain may cause gastrointestinal distress, while signals from the gut may alter mood. The brain and gut are also connected by the body's immune system. And this is very relevant for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, is the microbes in your gut change how your immune system works. They can cause inflammation that spreads throughout the body and then can change how the brain is receiving information and how the brain is receiving chemicals. Jack's research suggests that by eliminating inflammation-causing microbes in the intestines through medication or dietary changes, we might prevent Alzheimer's disease. And that is a phenomenal change in understanding. This gives me hope that no one else in my family will have to suffer from this crippling disease in the future. With these neurodegenerative late-life diseases, patients often have changes in their brain years before you see any symptoms. Do you think we could see an almost microbiome signature of these changes and then jump in with some early preventative measures? I think that is absolutely possible, right? In combination with looking in your blood and seeing if there are biomarkers of the disease, we could also look in your stool and look at the types of microbes which would cause the disease to start progressing. So we may be able to transform our ability to predict it early in the future. Jack is developing a new technology that will allow people to track biomarkers in their gut microbiomes at home. 
This is a, a, a mock-up that we're using. Very nice. Um, but we've developed a toilet seat, literally just this part of the toilet, that allows for the collection in an automated way of stool. Yeah. Um, and then provide you with updated, regular information about the microbes and their functions that are present there. Or we might be able to provide you with an update on what kind of foods you should eat then we may be able to prevent disease from developing in the first place by changing what microbes are present in your gut. That would be a phenomenal improvement in our understanding of human health. As for my short experiment, the fried and fatty junk food had a negative impact on the balance of my microbiome. Jack recommends sticking with healthier eating and consuming more fibre. By analysing, optimising and managing our own microbiomes, we could create a future where diseases are kept at bay. In the future, many people perform health checks by profiling their microbiomes at home. In real time, toothbrushes sequence the DNA of billions of microbes in the digestive tract. The data is networked with appliances, allowing individuals to receive automatic daily food deliveries that are personalized for optimal health. This data also syncs with medication dispensers, which fine-tune prescriptions to diversify the microbiome and boost the immune system. Since studies have shown that microbiome transplants can be used to transfer diseases from one animal to another, I wonder if this same technique could be used to cure disease as well. I'm outside Boston to meet Carolyn Edelston, her open biome organization is combating a notorious bacteria, C. difficile, or C. diff. Open biome is helping fight this life-threatening gut infection with a radical treatment, human fecal transplants. C. diff, or C. difficile, is uh, the most common hospital-acquired infection in the US, actually. Who is at risk of contracting it? Oftentimes what happens is someone will go into a hospital or a long-term care facility, they'll go on antibiotics and they'll acquire a C. diff infection. What happens when you go on antibiotics is a lot of the microbes uh, that are normally present in your gut get wiped out. And without that competition, C. diff is able to, to spread and to start producing the toxin that makes you sick. C. diff is really difficult to, to kill and to get rid of because it makes little spores. These toxic spores are C. diff's most ruthless weapon against the body. Because of this, it's pretty easy for patients to be colonized by C. diff. C. diff infects a half a million Americans every year, with a staggering mortality rate as high as 30%. But a novel solution has been developed to change the gut's ecosystem and restore and rebalance the gut microbiome of those infected. Most of the time, C. diff can be treated with a fecal transplant. So you take a sample of stool from a healthy person, and in that stool is trillions of bacteria that live inside our guts. And what we're doing is transferring that community of bacteria into the colon of a patient to outcompete the pathogen. Similar approaches were pioneered by the Chinese in the fourth century when they prescribed yellow soup made with fecal matter to treat colon diseases. By rebalancing and rediversifying the gut microbiome, the return of beneficial bacteria should keep the C. diff infection in check. Associate Director of Biomanufacturing, Delassi Delaseshi, is going to show me how they make this cutting edge science a reality. Hair net first, mm -hmm. face mask, a couple pairs of gloves, lab coat, and shoe covers. And why do we have to wear all of this gear? To make sure that as humans, we're not contaminating the product that's going into an already uh, compromised patient. I mean, I'm looking fantastic, so... Great. Feeling great, looking great, ready to go. Perfect. Awesome. This is essentially the first step. Yeah. Well, this is where they'll do a visual assessment of the sample. And what are the assessment criteria for a piece of poo? Like, what, what is yeah. a good piece? So there's a visual assessment for color. It's also assessed for size. There's also a scale that we grade the, the stool on. It's going to give you viscosity, uh, texture, hardness. I never thought I'd say I'm looking forward to seeing a piece of poo. Yeah. But yeah. here we go. I'm excited. So this is the actual uh, stool that's going to be processed. What would you say this one is? Uh, we, we determined that it would be a four. A Bristol four, essentially, that's kind of known as like the perfect texture for okay. a, a stool sample to come in, and then she'll continue processing. I feel like it's really interesting, though, like, you guys are obviously quite immune to it, maybe, because 
you work with this every day, for me, that was like, whoa. Once the microbial diversity of the stool samples are determined to be sufficient, they are stored in giant freezers. Oh, wow, there are a lot yeah. of freezers. Welcome to the freezer firm. It's amazing. These remedies are stored at minus 80 Celsius to keep the healthy bacteria viable before shipping to hospitals and clinics. So they're mixed with a saline and glycerol solution. This is a fecal microbiota preparation uh, that will be delivered by colonoscopy. So this is mm -hmm. the most common treatment format that we make. Um, and this is what it looks like. To date, Open Biome has shipped over 50,000 fecal transplant treatments around the world. Though not fully approved by the FDA yet, the treatment looks promising. About 85, 90% of the time, you deliver uh, a single infusion of stool into a patient's colon and uh, they'll beat the C. diff infection. That's really amazing. For one lucky survivor of C. diff, Jen Cooper, this fecal transplant procedure was her only hope. Hi. Can you tell me when you first got sick? I first got sick um, a few years back when I'd been hospitalised with gallbladder infection, which turned into a blood infection. So they put me on extremely strong antibiotics. All the antibiotics I had just killed all that good bacteria in my tummy. And finally got diagnosed with C. diff. What were your symptoms of the C. diff? I'd go to the toilet 15 times a day. The exhaustion was just crippling. So, so much fatigue. I would spend days in bed. It messed with your head, it messed with your body. It was just, it was a nightmare. So it really did like flip your life upside down having this condition? Oh, absolutely. You just get to a point where you're so over it. You just want help. But the faecal transplant had a tremendous impact as beneficial bacteria kept the C. diff infection in check. I feel like a different person. I feel years younger. <laughs> I have energy. It's above and beyond what I thought it would do. Oh, well, I'm wishing you all the luck. Scientists are now investigating whether this treatment might work for other conditions like obesity and autoimmune disorders as well. Novel medical approaches like this that harness the power of a balanced microbiome are forging the future to a disease-free world. In the future, Full microbiome replacements are mainstream procedures to fight modern diseases. Recipients first select from a large catalog of ultra-healthy donors. In the clinic, patients' microbiomes are completely replaced with entirely new microbial ecosystems. Once the recalibrated microbiome takes hold, it re-engineers the body itself, prompting healthier eating habits, more desire for physical activity, and a heightened mental state. If there's one thing I've come to realize, it's that microbes can be as much a source of good as they can be for harm. But to find our way to a disease-free future, the trick is getting the balance and diversity just right. And it's not a straightforward path at all. No one knows this better than Dr. Jack Gilbert, whose own path of restoring the healing power of microbial diversity has been full of twists and turns. One very important reason Jack is motivated to pursue this research is his own son. I have a child with autism. As soon as I found out that my son might be slightly different to other people, I always wanted to figure out a way that I could help him. I don't think autism is a disease that we need to fix, but I did want to be able to help him to realise his full potential, as any parent would. About 2% of children in the US are diagnosed with autism. Recent studies show that individuals with autism have abnormal gut microbes. So Jack has been working on rebalancing the microbial diversity of those with autism, including his son. We actually developed a dietary supplement to improve his health. So he eats a lot of fiber now, and he takes butyrate supplements and omega-3 supplements that help him to regulate his behavior and his health. But Jack has found that the most effective way to boost microbial diversity is to boost humanity's interaction with non-sterile natural environments. Kids need physical interaction with the environment. Physically interacting with the world around them shapes how their immune system works, which can protect them from allergic disease asthma, maybe even obesity and neurological diseases like depression and anxiety. 
We think this might be fundamental to the process by which a human body develops. I think that's the best recipe, <laughs> is let kids play in the dirt. And it's not just natural environments that give this kind of boost in the fight against modern diseases. Exposure to animals can also play an important role. We published some research which suggested that when you had dogs interacting with your family, it actually increased the amount of microbial exposure children got, and it increased the degree of microbial sharing between people. We know that children that grow up with interacting, physically interacting with a dog yeah. under the age of one years old, when they're very young, have a 13% reduction in the likelihood of developing asthma. It's wow. huge, right? Huge. If they grow interacting in a farm environment, there's almost a 50% reduction in the likelihood of developing asthma. To investigate this relationship between microbial diversity and the natural environment, Jack spent time studying two different communities that live on farms, both of which practice 19th century agricultural ways of life. We started exploring two groups of people in the United States called the Amish and the Hutterites. Uh, they both live a very rural existence where they don't really like technology, you know, no, no cameras, no televisions, etc. But they have one very specific difference. While both communities lead a rural lifestyle, Hutterite children don't interact with farm animals or crops, but the Amish children do. The Amish, kids grow up milking cows and working with the animals, and we think that the exposure they get to that farming environment, to the microbes in the cows and in the sheep and in the horses, actually trains their immune system. The Hutterite kids are severed from their interaction with the farm, and we see this reflected in their health. As a result, Hutterite kids don't require the subsequent immunity training from this exposure. The Amish only have about 4% asthma in their population. That's uh, half the US average, whereas the Hutterites have a significant elevation in the disease rate. With these dramatic findings, Jack's lab has been looking at ways that those of us who live in more sterile urban environments can bring the microbial diversity of the farm back to our bodies and our microbiomes. We've got one strategy that we've been developing. We have living surface materials with bacteria that we could place in a home or a hospital even and enable that home or hospital wall to have the beneficial properties of, say, a farm. It sounds a little bit science fiction-y, but in the future, we may be able to build entire cities out of biologically alive materials, and maybe even spaceships. We work with NASA on trying to see if these uh, materials could be beneficial for long-term spacecraft missions to Mars, for example. Oh, amazing. That is really interesting. On my journey towards a disease-free future, it's become clear that humanity's relationship with our microbes is complicated. I didn't realise the importance of the human microbiome and how important it is for our individual health. We need to balance the bad with the good, but we're running out of time. In an era of deforestation and urbanisation all over the globe, the struggle today is to preserve the diversity of microbes that make up the human microbiome before it's too late. But as a scientist, I know to never underestimate human creativity and innovation for solutions. In the future, what we want is really to understand which are the microbes that are essential, what is their function, and then be able to use them as probiotics. So we are part of an initiative called the Microbiota Vault. A joint project of Gloria, Rob, Jack, Martin and many others, the Microbiota Vault will be like a Noah's Ark for microbes. Microbiota Vault, it's a project that has long-term storage in a very isolated place to collect microbial diversity from traditional peoples and then be able in the future to use them to restore our microbiome because we know it's going to disappear. I believe a vault like this may provide one important key to the disease-free world of the future. And armed by this arsenal of microbes we evolved with, scientists will open up a trove of new methods to fine tune our microbiome and improve the health of everyone. In the future, I think microbiome research is going to lead to the possibility of having customised microbiome therapy, what we call personalised medicine. By bio-augmenting our bodies with new microbes, we can train our immune system to attack cancer. 
We can alter the types of bacteria living inside us to treat depression and treat things like obesity and diabetes. That will have a fundamental impact on how we deal with our modern day plagues. Microbiome is going to revolutionize medicine. As for me, my hopes for medicinal applications hit a little closer to home, and it's inspired my research in neuroscience. With any luck, microbiome therapy may one day provide a remedy for Alzheimer's and other diseases. But for the world as a whole, my hope is that the restoration of the microbiome will not only boost the health of everyone, but lead people to happier and more fulfilling lives.